say dialysis is not for you, right? Yes, you would, you would agree with that. Yeah. And I say, but I saw Shirley MacLaine on television, and she was told by or whoever, I don't care, Dr. Oz. Dr. Oz, that will work. <laughs> Dr. Oz, that will work. Hey, whatever, whatever your preference is, doc, Dr. Ruth, if you want, I mean, I don't doc, doc, Dr. Oz will work great. And Dr. Oz said, you know, if you have a head cold, the best way to get rid of it is dialysis. All right? And I tell you this, and I take out of my wallet my American Express card, and I say, I will pay you your charge master rates for this dialysis. So now this money's running around your head, of course. Right? The good doctor, and you will agree, a good doctor will refuse to do dialysis. It's medically futile. It does no good whatsoever for my head cold. And it has risks, a minor risk, but risks of infection. So, Do you agree with that? Yeah. Does everybody in the room agree with that? The doctor gets to make those decisions. Now, doctors get to do all sorts of other things, too. Doctors get to give advice. Doctors are not limited. I'll get to that way in the end, but I want to say it here. Doctors are not limited to pulling out a list of journals in the American Medical Association and telling their patients, go home and read it and decide what treatment you want. I mean, doctors are doctors. They get to give advice. They know their patients. They have their patients' best interests at heart. So doctors still have authority to say no when a treatment is medically futile. Now we get to the heart of this thing, which is what are the criteria for medical futility? How do you figure this out? How do you figure out that a treatment is medically futile? And this has got an introduction too, see. Who decides on the criteria? Now there's an interesting question, isn't it? Who decides on the criteria for medical futility? And I've always thought that the best way to look at that question is to go back to who decided on brain death and what we were going to call brain death and what we weren't going to call brain death. Remember when that big debate showed up in the, in the 60s, it was mainly in the 60s, and there were some people, and still are some people, who held that once a patient's, a person's higher brain functions are gone, irretrievably gone, the higher brain functions are gone, that patient is dead as a human being. And by the way, there's all sorts of neat Catholic theological backup for that, but this, this contemporary bunch of Catholics would want to talk about. But anyway, it is. It's there. <laughs> Sorry, it is there. But the decision was made, no, we don't want to do that. Why? Well, lots of reasons. Um, the most obvious practical reason is that it would apply to people in persistent vegetative state, properly diagnosed. The upper brain is gone. The brain stem's working perfectly fine, thank you very much. They're lying on bed. They're breathing away. They need to be fed and... and, uh, and uh, uh, antibiotics now and again, and I don't think that's morally required. I don't think it's morally required. But as long as you do it, they stay, they, they're, they're there, they're still breathing. And the decision was made by society as a whole. Yes, the politicians and the ethicists and the sociologists and certainly the doctors and the nurses in the hospitals, that we didn't want to declare these people dead. We did not want to bury breathing corpses. Every word in there is exactly accurate. If you declare a person who is in persistent vegetative state to have died, you will bury a breathing corpse. Sounds shocking, but that's what's there. Or you stop them from breathing and then you bury them, which is essentially the same thing. So we didn't want to do that. We also did not want to obviously bring forward the time of death in the 15th century if somebody was in such a state and you couldn't feed them and they couldn't wake up. They'd bring in the priest, and they'd know they were going to die soon, but as long as they're on the bed breathing, they'd say they were alive. Yes so far? Yes? Okay. That was a societal decision. The decision was not made by the American Neurological Association. It wasn't made by uh, Academy of Neurology, sorry. It wasn't made, I guess that's right. What is it? American Academy of Neurology, isn't it? You, is it? Do they go together? Okay, sorry. See, you, all right. They didn't come up with these decisions, but it is the neurologist that runs the tests, yes? The neurologist runs the tests for brain death. That's the doctor's area, but the wider who makes the criteria area are social, and I think the same thing applies here. Okay, finally, what are the proposed criteria? And there are four of them. This is the heart of this whole thing. There are four of them that have been proposed by various people in the literature who want to expand. See, we can go back and look at this again. Who want to expand 
the understanding of medical futility from what it used to mean to let it mean more. Four criteria have been proposed. First criterion, and nobody has any complaints about this, the treatment does not do in the immediate physiological sense what it is supposed to do. Dialysis does not cure head cold. Stupid. A patient is, uh, uh, yeah, all right, uh, um, um, you, you, you really should be able to do dialysis. Dialysis would keep the patient alive, but you can't find a shunt site because the entire venous system is broken down. You can't do it. It's medically not possible. No one thinks that doctors are obliged to do that. It's medically futile. Doctors refuse. Second proposed criterion. So physical impossibility. Second proposed criterion. Though the treatment does do in the immediate physiological sense what it is supposed to do, it does not prolong the life of an imminently dying patient by even a, I'm going to fill in the blank later, short period of time. No one argues against that except for the blank, and we'll get back to that later in just a second. Example. Stupid example, but stupid examples stay there. You may have real ones. Uh, a woman uh, is dying of um, uh, whatever and is in the last stages of a terminal illness. And her son comes in and says, you know, my mother's been complaining about her hip. I want a new hip for my mother. And the doctors say, your mother's never going to get out of the bed. What the hell are you going to give her a new hip for? And the son says, because I want one and she would want one too. And I even have a, a living will that says, if I'm ever, you don't get this, of course, I'm ever permanently unconscious and it won't hurt, then please give me a new hip. This is medically futile. The doctors are exactly right to refuse to do it, because although it does do what it's supposed to do, she's got a new hip, it makes absolutely no difference to the remaining life of a dying patient. Does that make sense? Medically futile, nobody argues, don't do it. Now that little blank line is a problem. Person is dying of metastatic cancer, is in the ICU, has uh, had uh, the heart has stopped three times, the family insists on CPR every time it is stopped, and now the family insists on another round of, uh, uh, keep, keep the CPR going. And the physicians don't want to do this, and they're right not to want to do this. But every time they do do the CPR, the person lives on for another 24 hours or so that the person would not otherwise have lived on for. No one has come to a satisfactory conclusion about that. And here, and this will be the first opinion that I'll give you, my opinion is if you can be virtually certain that the demanded treatment does not prolong the life of a dying patient by three days or more, you can declare it medically futile. But I have to tell you that that's an opinion. It's a reasonable opinion, but it's just an opinion. The courts may not agree with that. And there may be exceptions to that opinion. Let's say I'm dying in a hospital, and they say, you know, uh, if we do CPR again, it'll just work for a very short period of time. And I say, you know, I really would like that because my daughter is coming back from Europe with my first grandchild, and I'd like to see them before I die. Now that same stupid treatment starts to make human sense. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? Now the patient has a real reason for the CPR and so it's not medically futile, and if it's not medically futile, it can't be decided by the doctor, and so maybe the three-day thing is not a good thing to start with in the first place. See the problem? Medical ethics is not an exact science. But in almost all cases, it seems to me, if the physicians all agree, that this treatment cannot prolong the patient's life by more than a very short period of time, two or three days, you can declare it medically futile. What everyone absolutely agrees with is you can declare it medically futile if it does not prolong the life of a dying patient by even a very short period of time. Now you're on firm ground, it's medically futile, stop the treatment. If you do it, you're bad doctors, it's contrary to the standard of care. 
The problems really start with the third and fourth criterion. The third criterion is probability of success. Guy's got metastatic cancer. The first round of chemo took, you know, the blood counts got better or whatever. The tumors went down and he lived on a couple years and then maybe three and got a second round of chemo and that gave him six months and he get a third round of chemo and that gave him two months and he had a fourth round of chemo, didn't do him any good at all. And now the doctors have got a fifth round of chemo and the chances are like 1% that it's done, going to do any good. It's, there's a 1% chance that this will, it will prolong this guy's life by four or five months. And there's a 99% chance that all it'll do is make him sick. Now who gets to decide? Unfortunately, the patient gets to decide. Because again, this is not a purely, a purely medical decision. The doctor should strongly urge against it, but the patient may have a reason, the kind of reason that I talked about with my first grandchild. I mean, the patient may have a reason for wanting that 1% chance of the two months left. You may have a reason for this. Now, I use 1% because when the literature started on medical futility in the strict sense, on, in, the, in the specific sense, in 1988, that was one of the proposed criteria. If, as a matter of fact, it is less than a 1% chance that it's going to do any good, you don't have to do it, it's medically futile. And my sense is, and the court's sense is, and the general sense is that, sorry, that decision has to be made by the patient or the patient's family. But, you know, 1%, hey. Final proposed criterion, and I think here's where we get into the most trouble, Final proposed criterion, a quality of life criterion. If in the opinion of the physicians this is not going to enhance this patient's life at all, they can stop it on their own unilaterally, even though the patient and or the family want it. And obviously you can see where you get in yourselves into trouble on that, but that was nonetheless one of the proposed criteria at the beginning. Please let me repeat, I have never seen a case of medical futility where I thought the doctors were wrong about whether or not the treatment made sense. The doctors were always, the hospitals, nurses, whatever, the doctors were always right that the treatment didn't make any sense. I would never want it for myself, and I would never choose it if I had durable power of attorney for a loved one. Does that make sense? The question is, who gets to decide? And the answer is, the patient and the patient's family gets to decide. Let me give you an all too unfortunate example. For centuries, it has been the Roman Catholic teaching that extraordinary means to keep people alive are not morally required. You can ask for them, but you don't have to ask for them. The tradition has always judged this on the basis of weighing human burdens against human benefits. That means that a patient who is in persistent vegetative state, and I know, I know, you have to wait a year if it's, uh, half a year if it's trauma, whatever, and a year if it's, a year if it's chronic, or maybe it's the other way around, I guess it's the other way around. Doctors know that. See, I don't have to know that. Doctors know that. You have to wait. You can't just make the diagnosis right away. I understand that. But when you know a patient, Terry Schiavo, after three years, for God's sake, is never going to wake up again, the Catholic tradition has never, maybe until recently, and that's the problem, we don't know yet, insisted that that treatment be given. Recently there have been some things from Rome that says you have to do it, and it goes on and on, and we don't need to get down that, it's a whole other thing, and you don't care about that, but it's out there, and it's real. Catholic bishop shows up in your hospital. He's had a bad stroke, he's been there now for two years, he's in a persistent vegetative state. You decide you're going to turn off the feeding tubes on this guy. You think you're going to get away with that? Right? But if anything is in the category of expanded medical futility, it ought to be this, yes? I mean, here's feeding tubes and antibiotics and maybe a ventilator now and then for somebody who never wakes up, never dreams, never does anything. Please, this person should be allowed to die. But everybody in this room is going to agree that if it's some big wig Catholic lawyer or Catholic bishop, you're not going to turn that tube off. Sorry, guys, but if you're not going to turn that tube off, you cannot expand the definition of medical futility beyond those first two criteria, because sure as hell, that one fits the fourth criteria. Does that make sense? 
Not asking yet if you agree with me now, but does that make sense so far? All right. Expanding the notion of medical futility to include treatments with a very low likelihood of success or treatments that in the judgment of, I would hope, everybody, but obviously not this bishop and not his priests, or whatever, I get away from the Catholics, it could be somebody else too, Lord knows. In their judgment, this is what they want, it's the treatment they want. If you're not willing to turn that off, you can't expand the criteria for medical futility. You're stuck just as much as I am. Now, there are ways around this, and I'll get to the ways around this in a minute, but that is pretty much the heart of this talk. Medical futility means doctors must not do it. If they do it, they're bad doctors, they should get their license taken away. But the criteria for medical futility are very restrictive. Does no good in the immediate physiological sense. Dialysis for a stupid head cold. Don't do it. Does nothing to prolong the life of an imminently dying patient, new hip for a person dying of metastatic cancer. And so we're stuck exactly where we started. And you're just as frustrated now as you were when I got up here and started and told you you would be. Because physicians and hospitals just don't have the right, legally or ethically, on the basis of their medical expertise to refuse treatments that patients want, or families want, as long as those treatments keep people alive. Can't do it. Now let me give you some ways around this, and then I'm done, and none of the ways around this will satisfy you either, and they don't satisfy me. Um, but uh, we, can, we can get there, and uh, it would work. Okay, let me make sure I did all of this. I, I try to do it out there, because it's, it's more fun, but make sure I did this. I did that, I did that, I did that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I didn't say this, but it should be clear. Uh, treatments are not medically futile, which alleviate pain, are they? I mean, there's an exception to the idea, remember that second criterion, a treatment which does not, uh, which does not prolong the life of an imminently dying patient by even a very short period of time is medically futile. That doesn't apply to, to, to pain relief, obviously. Yes, I mean, you, you relieve their pain even though it does not prolong their life. That should be, that should be obvious. Oh, and by the way, 